West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Des photos de bord de mer Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver We've all heard Florida Governor Ron DeSantis obsess over one word. He's practically made it his calling card at this point. We reject woke ideology. We fight the woke in the legislature. We fight the woke in the schools. We fight the woke in the corporations. We will never, ever surrender to the woke mob. Florida is where woke goes to die. Woke has become the all-purpose Republican pejorative. It's not just DeSantis, even if he's the worst offender. And it's thrown around in all kinds of situations. But what does the word actually mean, especially to the governor of Florida? Well, we finally found out. Florida State Attorney Andrew Warren is now in court fighting his suspension by DeSantis earlier this summer for being a quote-unquote woke ideologue. Seriously, that was the reason DeSantis gave at the press conference announcing Warren's firing. And in court, DeSantis' lawyers were pressed to define what woke means to them. One DeSantis attorney said it was a slang term for activism. Another DeSantis lawyer responded that woke is the belief there are systemic injustices in American society and the need to address them. What? That's actually a pretty good definition. I have to say I was pleasantly surprised the first time I read that. But do DeSantis' people realize what they've done here? Because if that is their definition of woke, then most Americans, including most white Americans, are woke. Don't just take my word for it. According to a new poll, over 50% of white Americans believe that there is systemic racism in this country. Not only that, 75% of white Americans agree that we as a society should do something to address the impacts of discrimination in the United States. So when DeSantis says he doesn't believe that there are systemic injustices in America that need addressing, when he dismisses that as woke, he's in the minority. So frankly, DeSantis may want to rethink espousing such an unpopular opinion, especially if he's still considering running for president in 2024. Face it, Mr. Governor, most of the country has already woken up to the injustices that stare us in the face. And it's time you did too. Joining me now to talk more about this is Brandon Wolf, the press secretary for Equality Florida. Brandon, thanks for coming back on the show. First obvious question to you. You are a a person of color. You are a gay man in Florida. How do you define woke? Well, uh, thanks for having me back on. And I am definitely woke. I consider myself woke. And I actually think this might be one of the first times that Governor DeSantis's team has told the whole truth and nothing but the truth, which is to say that woke is indeed being aware of the systemic injustices in this country, the ways that our structures are designed uh, with certain you know, benefits in, in mind for, for 
you know, particular groups of people. And by the way, the idea that we're not going to address those things, we're not going to solve those things by accident, that our work has to be intentional to change the systems and structures around us to ensure that we make good on our promise of a country that is equal for and and open to all people. Um, seems like DeSantis there was, was admitting that that is what the word woke actually means. And if you heard in his speech there, he's also admitting that that is where, uh, you know, that Florida is where that idea of addressing systemic injustice in our country uh, goes to die. So he is essentially admitting that, you know, he's on board with the book banning agenda, the censorship agenda. He'd rather replace real American history with propaganda, because in this state, the idea that we're going to do something to make our country better for all people is uh, it, that idea goes to die. Uh, we played and you mentioned his uh, election night victory speech, but we could play clips of DeSantis on wokeness all day. Have a listen to this one. It raises the issue of what I call the woke mind virus. The woke ideology is destructive. It is motivating disastrous policies in our country. So the woke mind virus, a phrase that his pal Elon Musk, who endorses him, has also used. Um, <laughs> at what point do they realize that this strategy surely has diminishing returns? Just going on and on about woke. Well, I think you're seeing the the sort of divergence of that happening right now, right? You've got DeSantis, who is using it in a political way. He's using it solely as a, as you said, pejorative to whip up fervor inside the right wing base. He uses it from behind the podium. It gets lots of cheers and applause. He uses it in fundraising emails to try to drive right wing dollars into his coffers. But at the same time, his legal team knows that the actual definition of woke probably plays pretty well with the majority of the country. But they're bound by the idea that in a court of law, you have to tell the truth. When they start facing accountability from the very same people who were polled and said, yes, there really is systemic injustice in this country and we have to do something about it. When those people stop giving dollars to people like DeSantis, when those people stop casting ballots for people like DeSantis, then they'll move on to their next boogeyman. That is entirely the, the strategy here. It is cynical in nature. It is politically motivated. It's about scoring cheap, short term right wing political points. And the only way that we stop politicians like DeSantis from trafficking in this stuff is to make them face accountability for saying it and to pull those donations and those votes that they're looking for. What's so interesting is they've given this definition in court, which sounds pretty reasonable to me, uh, something a lot of people could get behind. But we know that in the everyday use of it online, in conservative circles, in right wing media, it's really a pejorative and it's really related to black people. And I would say exhibit A, Disney casts a black actress in their live action version of The Little Mermaid and they get a backlash for being too woke because they cast a black person in a movie. Uh, surely woke is now in its popular, and I use popular in a literal way, it's popular term on the right, is just a coded way for conservatives to talk about black people without having to use old words like the N-word. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, in the age of, you know, social media environment where you can't quite say those things out loud, you can't use the N-word frequently, you can't use, you know, some of the other bigoted tropes, you can't call LGBTQ people groomers without getting banned on social media platforms because, by the way, those things violate their terms of service. Uh, folks are creating different ways of, of working around it. And it's also part of the right-wing strategy at large to take things that are, you know, culturally a part of of the black community to take black culture to warp it and pervert it into an insult toward black people because keep in mind that the word woke the term woke came from the black community talking about systemic injustice uh there was you know there was an encouragement between folks in the community to stay woke as they continue to battle back against racism and bigotry in this country. And so it's no surprise that the right-wing strategy, as it often is, is to take a word that's been colloquially used among black and brown folks to warp it, pervert it, and use it as a weapon against that very same community. Yeah. They are masters of that. Uh, Ron DeSantis, Brandon, is beating Donald Trump by 10 points in a recent primary poll. Are liberal Floridians looking forward to him stepping down as governor in order to run? Uh, do you think he'll be able to tweak the rules in Florida and be able to run for federal office at the same time as being governor? 
Yeah, it's unfortunate because the the legislature in the state of Florida is wholly owned by Ron DeSantis and their priorities are essentially whatever Ron DeSantis priorities are. That's why they've become so obsessed with assaulting LGBTQ people. It's why they've become obsessed with rolling back voting rights. And it's now why they've said out loud that they have an interest in changing the rules. So Ron DeSantis can both be governor and candidate for president for just about as long as he wants. I will say that, you know, I, I hope that people around the country are waking up to the real crisis that Ron DeSantis uh, is in Florida and the threat that he poses to our nation. There is this obsession with painting him as some more rational or reasonable version of Donald Trump, but they're cut from the same authoritarian cloth. They're willing to bend the rules of government, every mechanism uh, of the, the public sector to their will. They're willing to punish people who speak out against them, including DeSantis's, you know, war against Walt Disney Company, willing to dissolve a local government uh, to, to clap back at them for having a differing opinion from him. Um, and they're willing to assault the very function of democracy. DeSantis has has been on the front lines of the, the war against voting rights here in the state of Florida. DeSantis is not some return to moderation or the middle ground for the Republican yes. Party. DeSantis is just a younger, maybe, you know, fits in a better suit Donald Trump. They're cut from the very same authoritarian cloth and they have the same end goals of ultimate power I for them and their allies. I agree with you on authoritarianism in particular, and just on authoritarianism, one last question. We're talking about the woke definition because it came out in court. It was in court because Andrew Warren, this suspended attorney, took DeSantis to court. Governor Ron DeSantis in Florida basically suspended this Democrat, this attorney, because of his views on abortion and transgender rights, but not because he had done anything, not based on any specific cases, but on the grounds that he might do something in the future that Ron DeSantis disagreed with, or that Ron DeSantis thinks goes against Florida law. That's a very, very authoritarian thing to do. It's almost kind of minority report-esque. Right. It's very it's chilling and people should be horrified because, you know, it's not it, it. First of all, it's not the first time DeSantis has become notorious in Florida for removing locally elected officials, whether that's city commissioners, county commissioners, members of the school board. He replaced almost the entire Broward County School Board, uh, which is a safe blue part of our state. Uh, DeSantis has become notorious with removing people from positions of power if they dare to challenge him or have a dissenting opinion. And so you got to ask yourself, if DeSantis became president, why wouldn't he do the same thing around the country? What would stop him from using the levers of government to punish his political opponents, to remove people from power, to do everything possible to make sure that he had stacked every level of government with sycophants and allies of his own. That is who DeSantis yeah. is. He's no friend to democracy. He's certainly no friend to Florida. And I would urge people uh, to pay attention because he's no friend to the country either. It is Wednesday, the 7th of December of 2022. And you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. And even though we need to be rid of all these meddlesome priests, truly Smothered Benedict Wednesdays is really just a lovely egg dish with a velvety hollandaise sauce. Very velvety. Anyway, that stated, it would still be nice to be rid of all these meddlesome priests because I like a separation of church and state. Yeah... Yeah, I'm old-fashioned that way. Or maybe I'm just a romantic. Yep. Looks like uh, democracy was saved by the veritable skin of its teeth in Georgia. And thankfully, uh, Warnock ran a fabulous campaign. Even though a lot of people were saying he ran a terrible campaign. No, you do uh, the art of war strategy. If your enemy is just making a fool of themselves, stand back. Let them do it. If someone wants to keep talking and making themselves look really, you know, out there, stand back, let him do it. And uh, when he did finally attack, it was done in a very pointed manner. And towards the end, to pretty much put an exclamation point on all that went before. I think Warnock ran a great campaign because it's not just going in front of a microphone and uh, pillaring your opponent. It also means knocking on a million doors. Is that, I, I think that's what I heard. Well over a million doors were knocked on. And that takes quite an organization. And you can thank Stacey Abrams for that. 
And you can tell how dedicated these volunteers were to go and knock on doors when a 15-year-old kid was shot in the gut by some idiot shooting right through his door. Now, I was wondering if this idiot was a renter, because if he had to buy a door, does he know how much it costs? And generally, when you buy a new door, a lot of times you got to replace the casing, too. And it's quite a bit of work. And I don't think renters are up to the task. Not to put down renters, I'm just saying. So, uh, shooting through his closed door because someone was knocking on it? Well... I guess, <laughs> you know, uh, they were standing their ground. A 15-year-old kid. Uh, yeah, I was knocking on doors when I was 12. I have to admit, there were many times when I thought, boy, I hope I don't run into somebody who wants to shoot because they were there or they were around back then. They were. All right, well... Uh, so we have a 51-seat majority in the Senate, and everybody's saying, oh, well, that's great, because now we don't have to have the VP to break ties. Well, last I checked, we still have Manchin and Cinema. Mm -hmm. They could throw things in disarray still. They've been labeled irrelevant. But just you wait. Just you wait. I think they got more. Uh, I think they got a lot more bag of tricks, okay, or bags of tricks, and it's not just them either. Though I will acknowledge that there are uh, Republicans who are willing to, if not outright caucus, at least vote uh, favorably, and favorably means like what we want. Uh, for what we want, they've already, uh, you know, dozen or more doesn't seem like a whole lot when you uh, consider, you know, all of the Senate. But still, it's it's it is more than a baby step. So uh, we already have some, uh, I guess you would call them the more moderate Republicans. Is that possible anymore? I don't know. Anyway, uh, maybe. Mansion and cinema will be irrelevant. I'm not holding my breath. I think they got some more plans in store. That's what I think. So, um, already though, on the House side, did you know that Lauren Boebert actually is under a recount at the moment? Because I think it was half a percentage point was what uh, separated her from her opponent. Democratic opponent. And uh, there is a recount going on as we speak. And yet, even before there's a, quote, Speaker of the House appointed, because, I mean, it's not official yet. I mean, ooh, well, we'll see. Anyway, it looks like we have an insurmountable amount. But regardless, in the Lauren Borbert case, they've already given her some leadership responsibility. She's going to be the chair of the oversight committee <laughs> or no, I'm sorry. I, I take that back. Not oversight, uh, policy, the policy committee, like Lauren Boebert knows a lot about policy. Mm -hmm. Well, I think what they're trying to do is they're getting their maggot ducks in a row on these upcoming chairmanships that they hope that they will be getting. And uh, it's going to be a Benghazi type uh, scenario for the two years that they hold on. So, uh, but I only mentioned Berbert, Bobert, Berbert, because what if she's not in the co in the Congress? What if she's not in the House? What what if she actually loses? Boy, one can only hope. But I don't know. Uh, we might as well just uh, accept that, uh, yeah, yeah, we're going to have uh, a lot of delaying tactics. And fortunately, Joe and the team have anticipated this and they are getting their ducks in a row. They're getting their lawyers and uh, representatives for talking points and more. 
They're getting their staff together to fight this onslaught of disinformation. Uh, Just look, I still don't quite understand how someone can take part in an insurrection. And I don't care if they got voted voted in or not. There's a little thing in the Constitution that says anybody who takes part in a plot to overthrow the United States of America cannot hold office. Not just cannot run for office, they cannot hold office. So, unfortunately, I think we have uh, maggot scotus now that will say, oh, yeah, well, you know, people's plots to and and actual uh, actions to overthrow the United States of America violently is their First Amendment right. And I guess their Second Amendment right, too. I will remind folks that none of the founders ever thought that we as the American voting public had a right to overthrow democracy. I don't think that's, you have a constitutional right to overthrow representative democracy. No, that's not what the founders originally intended, please. So all these arguments of like, oh, well, you know, we got to protect ourselves from King George. And I'm all, we don't have royalties here. You are conflating representative democracy with your inability to get a caucus together and a mandate so that you can advance your stupid agenda. At least within the constraints of a representative democracy. All right. So you have folks like Peter Thiel and Sachs and Musk. The founders address that scenario and dynamic in specific terms by stating an obvious that once you get a lot of money, sometimes you just don't have any national allegiances. And that is being proved out right at this very moment. Peter Thiel is tired of democracy. David Sachs is tired of democracy. Peter Thiel is tired of democracy. I would say long before they became tired of democracy, the Kochs, the Petersons, the DeVosses, etc., 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 became tired of democracy because they were not getting what they wanted because in representative democracy it looks like, oh, wow, equal protection and due process for all. We cannot have that. Cannot. So pack the courts. You know, I'm still trying to figure out this uh, Colorado case with the web designer who is, hasn't really designed anything on the web. And the SCOTUS took on the, the case in a minority report type of way because they are considering thought crimes in the future. What if... This woman who hasn't really designed any web pages is expected to design a web for a same sex couple or a web page for a same sex couple who are going to get married. And that uh, offends her religious sensibilities. So she has not been aggrieved. There is no party that uh, has been denied the services because no services exist yet, if ever. And yet this maggot scotus took on the case. All right. So uh, it, it, it's an insult to democracy. It's an insult to the rule of law, at least as we know it here in America. And that's all by design. All by design. I could go on, but it looks like, well, we've gone through a bit of time here at the start, so why don't we give you a rundown on what we have in store for you here in this salon we call West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy as we begin in the Bistro Cafe part of said salon because we still have the chef's table coming up, so keep a little bit of room for that. Well, at the top, yes, according to Ron DeSantis' own definition, most of the country is woke, and he is a distinct minority in a belief that 
<laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, well, we want systemic racism. Uh, actually, that is a minority view, even though they yell very loudly. On the rest of the menu, speaking of which, farmers of color sued the government for promised federal aid. And guess which party has been the roadblock in that effort? A federal judge ordered a nationwide slaughterhouse cleaning company not to hire minors. They were violating child labor laws at not just one place they were cleaning, but across the nation. And the House Ethics Panel fined Madison Cawthorn. Remember that guy? They fined him over $15,000 for promoting cryptocurrency. Yeah, he was uh, he had a financial interest in the company and he did not disclose it. After the break, we move to the chef's table where Russian mercenaries from the Wagner group are accused of using violence to corner the African diamond trade. And thousands of police carried out a series of raids across Germany against far-right extremists who sought to overthrow the state by force. With a little help from Russia. And that. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appetit. Radio.com. To the right of the page is the chat room link, and the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. To the left, across the page there from that chat room link near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com is the link to our Patreon page. And if you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio and possibly send us what you might spend on an espresso-type coffee drink, for instance, if you could afford to send those funds to us once a month, it helps us pay our bills, fly under the radar, and continue this powerhouse of resistance against... Well, well, uh, against dark forces that are arrayed against representative democracy, not only here in the United States of America, but as you'll see as we get to the chef's table today, forces that are dark arrayed against representative democracy around the world. We are but a small bulwark uh, against that, but <clears throat> we be mighty. And the reason for it is because of longevity. And that longevity is because of folks like you who have uh, supported us over these many, many years. And uh, we thank you. Thank you very much for your generosity. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, yes, we're there till the bitter end. You can do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. Thanks, Tom. Follow me on Twitter. We're going to be there until the bitter end. I post the show notes and links diary. Oh, yeah. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I post that show notes and links diary on Daily Co's 10 minutes before showtime. And uh, there's some links for you to be able to find that diary there on my uh, Twitter feed. So go check it out. You can also follow the show on Twitter. i uh, going to be there till the bitter end. You can find uh, the show on Twitter at Cookbook West and pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, and wherever podcasts can be found. All right. This first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is out of the Associated Press by Scott McFedridge. The federal government has illegally broken a promise to pay off the debts of a group of black farmers, according to a class action lawsuit. The group hopes to put pressure on officials to keep their word and to restore funding that was dropped after a group of white farmers filed legal challenges 
arguing their exclusion was a violation of their constitutional rights. I should mention that there were uh, quite a few Oregon white farmers of the maggot persuasion who filed lawsuit against this same uh, uh, policy and program. The lawsuit filed in October remains active, even as the U.S. Department of Agriculture moves forward with another effort to help farmers in financial distress, in addition to paying farmers who the agency discriminated against. John Boyd Jr., president of the National Black Farmers Association and one of four plaintiffs in the lawsuit, said that the new programs don't match the USDA's earlier offer to pay off 120% of the debt of farmers who are socially disadvantaged. According to the lawsuit, this definition applies to more than 6,500 farmers who have traditionally suffered racial or ethnic prejudice and are saddled with federal loan obligations. The lawsuit says this includes Native Americans or Alaska Natives, Asian Americans, Black Americans or African Americans, Native Hawaiians or Pacific Islanders, and Hispanic Americans or Latino Americans. My dad always said, if you give somebody your your word, then you should own up to it, Boyd said. They gave us their word. We signed a contract and sent it back in, and then they repealed the whole measure. I see it as a broken promise. The proposed payments and lawsuits from a long history of USDA refusing to process loans from farmers of color, and in some cases foreclosing more quickly than usual when such farmers who obtained loans ran into problems, the federal government settled a lawsuit in 1999 filed by black farmers and paid more than $2.4 billion, but court filings later acknowledged there were persistent problems in the USDA loan programs for farmers. In 1910, Black farmers owned more than 16 million acres of land, but today they have less than 4.7 million acres. Boyd was just 18 years old when he assumed an, an existing USDA loan upon buying his first farm in the early 80s. He was walking into his local USDA office was like a return to the Jim Crow era, he said. The lawsuit, filed by Ben Crump, a Florida-based civil rights attorney known for representing family members of George Floyd and other black people killed by police, stems from congressional approval of $5 billion in debt relief for thousands of farmers of color. The money was included in the $1.9 trillion COVID-19 stimulus package in 2021. White farmers in several states, including my state of Oregon, then filed lawsuits arguing that the law violated their rights, which prompted judges to halt the program in June of 2021. Faced with the likelihood of a lengthy court battle that would delay payments to farmers, Congress amended the law and offered financial help to a broader group of farmers. The new law allocated $3.1 billion to help farmers struggling with USDA back loans and $2.2 billion to pay farmers who the agency discriminated against. But white farmers don't want black farmers to have any of that money. Nope. We stole it fair and square, I'm sure they're saying. In a statement, the USDA said that litigation likely would have continued for years if they had not changed the law. The USDA completed a comment period on the discrimination component last month and is now drafting proposed rules for the program.
Josh Funk of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. A federal judge ordered a Wisconsin company that cleans hundreds of slaughterhouses nationwide to ensure it is complying with child labor laws after investigators identified at least 50 minors scrubbing and sanitizing dangerous equipment on overnight shifts at five different meat packing plants in three states. As part of the agreement with the Labor Department that was announced along with Tuesday's court ruling in Nebraska yesterday, Packers Sanitation Services, Inc. also promised to hire an outside consultant to review its hiring policies and provide additional training for its managers. Investigators with the Labor Department visited three plants owned by JBS and Turkey Valley Farms in Nebraska and Minnesota this fall and found 31 underage workers as young as 13. Since this lawsuit filed last month, additional underage workers have been identified, including at two additional plants, the Greater Omaha Packing Company Beef Plant in Omaha, Nebraska, and George's Inc. Poultry Plant in Springdale, Arkansas. Investigators also searched a Tyson's food plant in Sedalia, Missouri, but the Labor Department has not identified any miners working there yet. Thousands of pages of records from other plants are also being reviewed to determine if any additional miners are working there. At the plants where underage workers have been identified so far, investigators are comparing local school records with Packers Sanitation Services records to identify workers younger than 18. The company employs some 17,000 people working at more than 700 locations nationwide making it one of the largest firms out there that cleans food processing plants. Pebera of the Washington Post brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The House Ethics Committee has directed Representative Madison Cawthorn, repug from North Carolina, to pay more than $15,000 in fines and fees for encouraging people to purchase a cryptocurrency in which he had a financial interest that was not properly disclosed. According to the committee's 81-page report, Cawthorn has until the end of the month to pay $14,237.49, reflecting the approximate value of the gift he received to an appropriate charitable organization and an additional 1000 in late filing fees to the Treasury Department within 14 days of the report's release. The congressman lost his primary in May and his term expires next month. The House Panel's investigative committee found substantial evidence that Cawthorn promoted a cryptocurrency in which he had a financial interest in violation of rules protecting against conflicts of interest and that he failed to file timely reports to the House disclosing his transactions relating to the cryptocurrency, the report said. The subcommittee did not find Representative Cawthorn knowingly or willfully failed to file timely disclosures nonetheless. The investigative committee found that he is required by statute 
to pay the applicable late filing fees for his untimely disclosures. The committee investigated but did not find sufficient evidence of insider trading, efforts to artificially inflate the value of the coin, or an intent to personally enrich himself. The report also found no evidence to support allegations this year that Cawthorn had an improper relationship with a staffer. Cawthorn's office had no immediate response to the report. Well, that brings us to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. This week, The Last Supper. Music is entertaining and fun for some, but for others, it's a torturous exercise in an ever-narrowing quest for authenticity and purity. It's not just music. What I'll call aesthetic distillation is ongoing with everything that falls under the umbrella of art, which can be cynically defined as that which is created for analysis by critics, sort of like film and people like me. In the movie The Menu, we see this play out in the world of food. We first meet our guests at a fine dining spot called the Hawthorne as they board a boat to take them to the island where the restaurant is. They're a non-randomly selected lot of overindulged characters from entertainment, business, law, and journalism, including a food critic and a professional social media sycophant, with one exception. The fun really begins, though, when we meet Chef Julian and his creepy cult-like crew. Think Kim Jong-un's private kitchen, maybe. The movie has courses rather than chapters, with captions like on Netflix's Chef's Table, with introductions by Chef, which become more dissociative as the evening progresses. As a fly in the pate, however, is the sycophant's guest date Margot, turns out to be a paid escort replacement. Played by Anna Taylor Joy, she turns out to be the ultimate counterpoise to Chef, who's decided to make the evening payback for how his passion for cooking got perverted into foodie horror. Ralph Fiennes brings off Chef's disintegration with ferocious zeal, and Taylor Joy's personification of sanity is cinematically perfect. Food can be a metaphor for everything, in the menu from director Mark Mylott of Succession, so we know where he's coming from. The connection from cancer capitalism to hollow elitism is laid bare, and Margot gets to send it all up while eating a really good cheeseburger. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. This is the story of a very special woman. In a matter of seconds, she turned herself into a great mathematician or an entrepreneur. Her knowledge was limitless and still is. She could also make monsters disappear, especially those that lurked in the shadows under the bed. Once, this woman put back together a teenage girl's broken heart, which had been shattered in a thousand pieces just by giving her a bear hug. She masqueraded as a regular person at work, but as a superhero at home. Everyone knows her as Gabriella. I still call her mom. Your hero needs you now, and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need to help, complete with tips and resources, at aarp.org caregiving. A public service announcement brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. Wouldn't it be great if life came with a remote control? You know, you could hit pause when you needed to, or hit rewind. Like that time you knocked down that wasp's nest. Uh-oh. Or that time you forgot to roll up your windows in the car wash. Fantastic. Yeah, a remote control would have come in handy then. Well, life doesn't always give you time to change the outcome. But pre-diabetes does. With early diagnosis and a few healthy changes like managing your weight, getting active, stopping smoking, and eating healthier, 
You can stop prediabetes before it leads to type 2 diabetes. It's easy to learn your risk. Take the one-minute test today at doihaveprediabetes.org. Life doesn't come with a remote control. Yikes! So you're on your own with the wasps. You have the power to take control of prediabetes. Visit doihaveprediabetes.org today. That's doihaveprediabetes.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council and its prediabetes awareness partners. This is an important message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. When it snows this winter, make sure you clear more than your driveway. Before you hit the road and before you get in the driver's seat, check to be sure that your vehicle's tailpipe is clear of snow. If the tailpipe is blocked, carbon monoxide, an odorless, colorless, and deadly gas produced by your engine, can build up quickly inside your vehicle, poisoning anyone inside. To learn more, call 1-800-CDC-INFO. That's 1-800-232-4636. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Arthritis is common among veterans. Traumatic and overuse injuries during active duty are risk factors for developing arthritis. Fortunately, there are low-cost or no-cost strategies that can help veterans manage arthritis. Physical activity can reduce pain and improve function. It can also help improve mood and play a role in managing other chronic conditions, such as heart disease, diabetes, and obesity. You can do low-impact activities, such as walking, biking, swimming, and water aerobics, all good forms of exercise. Arthritis-specific classes can help you get started. Information on classes, exercise programs, and tools are available at cdc.gov arthritis. These resources can help reduce pain and improve function. Learning self-management techniques can help all veterans become more active, improve their overall quality of life, and thrive. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetRootsRadio.com, show your progressive side and go to the Donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power NetRoots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our Donate button at the bottom of NetRootsRadio.com. Thank you for keeping progressive radio at full power. Can being charged with driving under the influence result in a death sentence? I'm Tom Harbin, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute with ACLU attorney Bill Newman. Although, generally speaking, states can impose the death penalty only for murder, there's what the law says and then what the law does. And what the law often does is lock up people in jail pretrial. People presumed to be innocent because they are unable to post bail. Indeed, two-thirds of the people in jail are being held awaiting trial. And in jails across the country, in New York, Oklahoma City, Seattle, and Louisville, among others, there are an increasing number of deaths, deaths from suicide, and overdoses, and medical inattention, and assaults, and COVID. Consider Matthew Shelton, who in 2022, having turned himself in for an old OUI, was confined at the Harris County, that's Houston, Texas jail, that denied him insulin for his diabetes. After days of pleas from him and frantic calls from his family, Shelton went into a diabetic coma and died, the jail says, from a natural cause. The family says this is something that didn't need to happen. Matthew Shelton was 28. As the headline for this New York Times story summarized, quote, for a growing number of Americans, jail has become a death sentence. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because democracy and advocacy begin with you and freedom can't defend itself. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1931. That was the day that protesters staged a hunger march on Washington, D.C. 1,600 protesters took part in the march. Communist organizers helped to organize the protest. One of the demands of the march was unemployment insurance for workers who had lost their jobs. The country was in the throes of the Great Depression, caused by the stock market crash of 1929. Far too many people had seen their entire life savings wiped out by the crash and subsequent bank failures. Millions were out of work and families were losing their homes. 
problems. There was a growing anger in the country over what was perceived as President Herbert Hoover's indifference and ineffectual dealing with the crisis. The media focused on the communist ties to the D.C. hunger march. But the idea of the march on Washington grew. The next year, a Pittsburgh priest led an army of 12,000 jobless men to the Capitol to demand unemployment legislation. Then that May, a former cannery worker named Walter B. Walters organized World War I veterans to protest in D.C. They called themselves the Bonus Expeditionary Forces. They demanded early payment of a bonus that Congress had promised them for their service in World War I. The movement of working people grew as a weary and hungry nation demanded action from its elected leaders. As a result, Americans voted President Hoover out of office in the 1932 election. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt was elected on a platform that the U.S. government should act to address the dire conditions of the millions of unemployed. Finally, in August 1935, President Roosevelt signed the Social Security Act into law. This act contained a provision for unemployment insurance. It was a major step towards establishing unemployment protections for workers in the United States. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 34 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting highs in the low to mid 40s. Sun and clouds mixed later on. It's mostly cloudy at the moment. Uh, winds are light and variable and will remain so throughout the day. And then cloudy skies early this evening. Then off and on rain showers overnight, bringing with it over a quarter inch of rain. Lows will be in the low 30s, by the way, and winds are light and variable. And then rain tomorrow with highs in the upper 30s. Winds light and variable, bringing with it about a half an inch or more. And a snowy, rainy mix later on in the afternoon throughout the night. And we'll see what it's going to be like on Friday. We'll see. Uh forecast for another snowy mix and that may be so and it may turn out to just be snow it looks like pollen is rated as none outside the window here in rogue river proper the air quality index is in the moderate range which is not good for those with breathing problems it is at 54 parts per million and that's mostly because people are burning wood in their fireplaces to stay warm and who can blame them the daytime UV index is at the low range because it is winter, or close, and it is currently at level 1. Barometric pressure is falling at 30.22 inches. Visibility is at 6 miles, and relative humidity is at 100%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 39 degrees and partly cloudy. Paris is 42 and mostly cloudy. Rome is 60 degrees and fair. Kiev is 30 degrees and cloudy. Kabul is 38 and partly cloudy. Hong Kong is 63 and fair. Tokyo is 43 degrees and clear. Sydney, Australia is 68 and clear. San Francisco, California is 45 degrees and partly cloudy. And New York, New York is 58 degrees Fahrenheit and cloudy. And that is weather from around the world. Brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world.
Mary Ilyashina and Francesca Ebel of the Washington Post brings us this first amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. A Russian mercenary group that has gained international attention for its role in the war in Ukraine is also active in one of Africa's poorest countries using violence and extortion in an effort to corner its extremely lucrative diamond industry, according to a new report issued by Europe-based researchers. Individuals linked to the Wagner Group, which is most infamous for its brutal tactics in eastern Ukraine, have set up a shell company in the Central African Republic to secure and sell diamonds, say researchers from two groups. France-based All Eyes on Wagner and the London-based Dossier Center, sponsored by exiled Russian oligarch Mikhail Kordorkovsky and European Investigative Collaborations, a network of news organizations. The report says that fighters linked to the Wagner Group are forcing the country's impoverished miners and collectors to turn over their gems or sell them exclusively to the shell con- company Diamville, and that the company trades in diamonds that violate the rules of the Kimberley Process, an international initiative that seeks to prevent the marketing of diamonds from conflict zones. Wagner Group fighters previously had been accused of involvement in armed activities in the Central African Republic and of exploiting the country's gold and diamond resources. The report, which was shared with the Washington Post and other media, provides new details about the network of companies and Wagner operations in the country. Wherever there are mines and diggers, these people linked to Wagner are there armed, When someone, a gold or diamond miner, comes across something good, they go to that person. There have even been assassinations like that to take other people's merchandise, the report says, citing insiders in the country. The report's author sought to uh, sought comment from Yevigny Prigozhin, the Russian tycoon behind the Wagner Group, but he largely dismissed their request. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Frank Jordans of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Thousands of police officers carried out raids across much of Germany today against suspected far-right extremists who allegedly sought to overthrow the government in an armed coup. Officials said 25 people were detained. Federal prosecutors said some 3,000 officers conducted searches at 130 sites in 11 of Germany's 16 states. While police raids against the far right are not uncommon in the country, still sensitive to its grim Nazi past, the scale of the operation was unusual. Justice Minister Marco Buschmann described the raids as an anti-terrorism operation, adding that the suspects may have planned an armed attack on institutions of the state. Germany's top security official said the group was driven by violent coup fantasies and conspiracy ideologies. Prosecutors said the suspects were linked to the so-called Reich Citizens Movement, whose adherents reject Germany's post-war constitution and have called for bringing down the government. 
Officers detained 22 German citizens on suspicion of membership in a terrorist organization. Three other people, including a Russian citizen, were held on suspicion of supporting the organization, they said. Another 27 people were under investigation. The larger group is alleged to have believed in a conglomerate of conspiracy theories consisting of narratives from the so-called Iraq citizens as well as QAnon ideology, according to the statement. Prosecutors added that members of the group also believe Germany is ruled by a so-called deep state, similar to baseless claims about the United States were made by former President Donald Trump. Federal prosecutors said the group planned to install Heydrich PR as Germany's new leader and had contacted Russian officials with the aim of negotiating a new order in the country once the German government was overthrown. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up here tomorrow for... Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursday. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here tomorrow, right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver